There's an image from Daisy Coleman's story that I can't get out of my head. Just 14 years old, laying passed out on her front lawn, her hair frozen to the ground, left there by the popular football player who she says raped her. It is the high school he said, she said, that rocked a small town about a night of partying, drinking, and sex that made national headlines. When Daisy pressed charges, overnight she became the lying slut of her small town. She was relentlessly bullied at school and online. It got so bad that Daisy attempted suicide multiple times. I'm Amanda Knox. A lot of people wouldn't put Daisy and me in the same boat. What could a defendant and a plaintiff have in common? Well, both of us were let down by the justice system. Both of us were disbelieved and blamed. What do you think people don't know about you? I think people don't understand who I really was before all of this happened to me. I was almost like a stereotype. I had blonde hair, I was a cheerleader, I was on the dance team, I did pageants. I was such a sheltered child at the time. I was a good kid, just to put it that way. Then after everything happened, all they saw of me was me running away from school or me running away from the problem or lashing back at people that were lashing towards me. Daisy's life changed forever on a cold night in January 2012. She had snuck out to meet up with Matthew Barnett, a high school senior from a politically connected family. Early the next morning, Daisy's mom found her unconscious, barely clothed, and frostbitten in their front yard. I just remember waking up in my yard and being sore. I was inebriated whenever the assault happened, so I don't even remember the assault. The hospital records showed Daisy sustained injuries consistent with rape, and Barnett admitted on camera to having sex with her. So you had sex in your right pants. Did she ever say she didn't want to have sex with you? No. The felony sexual assault charge was dropped due to insufficient evidence. That's when the harassment started. One instant, some kid jumped out of his classroom when I was walking to the bathroom and called me a slut, and then I ran to the bathroom and called my mom and told her to take me home right now. You said that the ostracism and abuse that you suffered after, after your sexual assault was almost worse than the assault itself. I find that like people use social media as like a dehumanized way to speak to other people because they aren't, they aren't seeing your reaction on your face whenever they're saying these terrible things to you. From Maryville to coverage across the country, a girl's accusations of sexual assault made headlines when she said she was harassed after speaking out. There is like very little like action being taken whenever people were doing things in front of my face. And then when it was done on social media, the school was like, well, it's off of school grounds. We can't do anything. I wash my hands of this. Yes. The abuse got so bad that Daisy and her family were forced to move, and she even tried to commit suicide. The most trauma did come from so many people telling me all these things and then me believing I was those things because so many people were telling me that. And you lose a part of yourself because you're trying to rekindle with what you believe you are, but then everyone is telling you something exactly opposite, so it just completely misconstrues how you look at yourself. Yeah. Barnett later pled guilty to the lesser charge of child endangerment. He received no jail time. Yes, sir, 19-year-old Matthew Barnett told a judge, pleading guilty to one count of child endangerment, the conditions of his probation, no alcohol, and an apology and restitution to the family to cover counseling costs. I have to really sit and wonder if he actually is genuinely sorry, or if he did learn anything from this, or if he just is sitting out there somewhere thinking that things like this are still okay. I think one of the scarier parts of these kinds of stories is that a lot of sexual predators don't even realize that they're sexual predators. They, they're not you know, jumping out of bushes in the middle of the night and chloroforming someone and, and raping them. They're texting, they're plying with drugs and alcohol, and they think that that's all part of the game. The fact that like, People don't believe that they're assailants whenever they're doing that kind of stuff is just a part of the culture because that's what they were raised around and that's the environment that they were in where they think that things like that are okay. Mm -hmm. It's so depressing. I know. <laughs> I mean, you, you're smiling about it and, and you, can, you, can, 
You can smile about it. That's what's yeah. incredible, though. Like, how, how did you get to that point? There is a long point of sadness. And, you know, that was a part of me forgiving myself for what happened that night, is realizing that I didn't control this other guy's actions, that he only had control over his actions. It wasn't my fault. And since it's not my fault and it's not a hundred other people's fault that they were assaulted, that, you know, if no one else is going to speak about it, then I need to. After my assault had happened, I definitely felt like very, very alone in the beginning when I got so tired of being told to shut up all the time by someone. I was just always being told just to quit talking about it. And so, you know, that's when I decided to speak out about it. And then other survivors started coming forward to me and I realized this isn't just happening to me. This is happening to hundreds and hundreds of people, even men, and that we need to like do something about this and actually talk about it for once. That's why Daisy co-founded Safe Bay, a nonprofit that educates students about consent, acquaintance rape, and online bullying. I made an acronym for students so they can understand what consent exactly is, and that is MOVES. Consent is mutual, ongoing, verbal, enthusiastic, and sober. The culture that we're raised in, even in Disney movies, men are always portrayed as the go-getter and, you know, you never take a no for an answer. In Sleeping Beauty, he kisses the princess without her consent when she's asleep. And so we grow up thinking that's a romanticized thing, but it's not, that's a soul. I, I like that you have Veni Vici. Yeah. You came and you conquered. What did you conquer? I conquered people. Okay. That were, and I conquered my own mind, I feel like. So I think tattooing was a huge healing process for me because I was trusting another person with my body and giving them consent to do something with my body. So I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm really excited that you're going to tattoo me. And I really wanted to do the semicolon, but can you explain what that symbolizes and, and what it's all about? So the semicolon project was originally started by um, Amy Bloul. In a sentence, a semicolon is a pause. It's not an end, it's just a pause. And so what the semicolon represents is that your story isn't over yet, it's just paused for the moment. Are you ready? Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> Hearing a story like Daisy's, it's easy to see how reporting a rape can so easily backfire. People wanted to protect Matthew Barnett, so they ruined her life instead. Hers is just an example of something that happens all the time. Yeah, that's rad. Sweet. All right. The injustice here isn't that Barnett was afforded the legal presumption of innocence. The injustice is that Daisy, like so many sexual assault survivors, was punished just for coming forward. Talking about consent, allying yourself with, with victims and with people who have made mistakes and, and have learned from them and repented from them, that is a powerful movement. How'd it feel? It didn't hurt at all, actually. It was great. As ugly as losing one's innocence can be, you can grow into a really beautiful person out of it. 